you have your Bibles tonight, go ahead and turn to Genesis chapter 3. The fall refers to that moment in time when human beings first disobeyed God. They sinned together. The willful decision of Adam and Eve created a state of rebellion between the creation and her creator. Tonight we're going to look at Genesis 3, and most of you know it does talk about the fall, and this quite possibly may be the saddest chapter in the Bible. When we think of the realities of sin, it's quite depressing, um, saddening, and can make you feel pretty uncomfortable. You know, you don't wake up in the morning looking forward and saying woohoo to preaching on sin, but it is needed for today. And I believe this topic is more needed now than ever. As the culture embraces, full on embraces sin, you think about homosexuality, abortion, human trafficking, the denial of God, and the list goes on. These are things we can clearly see in script, in culture that defy God, that are sinful. And you know, we think about culture and we see the word has been diminished. Even that word sin, we don't hear it anymore. And it's caused people to think they may be morally acceptable. So I think this topic is more needed now than ever. And um, we're going to look at it tonight from the example of Genesis 3. And we're going to be looking at verses 1 through 7 tonight. It says, Now the serpent was more crafty than any other beast of the field that the Lord God had made. He said to the woman, Did God actually say you shall not eat of any tree in the garden? And the woman said to the serpent, We may eat of the fruit of the trees in the garden, but God said, You shall not eat of the fruit of the tree that is in the midst of the garden, neither shall you touch it, lest you die. But the serpent said to the woman, You will not surely die, for God knows that when you eat of your eat of it, your eyes will be opened, and you will be like God, knowing good and evil. So when the woman saw that the tree was good for food, and that it was a delight to the eyes, and that the tree was to be desired to make one wise, she took of its fruit and ate. And she also gave some to her husband, who was with her, and he ate. Then the eyes of both were opened, and they knew that they were naked, and they sewed fig leaves together, and made themselves loincloths. Now, my goal tonight is to show you from this chapter a description of sin. And you'll see that there on your handout. We're going to look at three areas that deal, that we see here that are dealt with in this chapter. But before that, I think it's important that we look at what is sin. How would you define sin? Now, I looked up several definitions this week. I mean, you can find short definitions, you can find long definitions. Here are a few that I found most helpful to our understanding. Uh, one was, sin is essentially man's failure to trust in God, an act or state of unbelief, an assertion of autonomy. Another one said, sin is any failure to conform to the moral law of God, an act, attitude, or nature. Then a little bit longer one said, Sin is a radical disruption in the core of our being. In sin, we turn from God's good commandments, His kingdom and glory, faith and love. It embraces rebellious disobedience, the kingdom of Satan, and evil attitudes. Summed up, sin is a negative thing. We know that. Sin is the opposite of what God wants and who He is. Sin is horrible. It's heinous. It's awful, and we must take it seriously. Consider a few other verses that we find throughout the Bible. 1 John 1, 3. Everyone who makes a practice of sinning also practices lawlessness. Sin is lawlessness. Romans 1, 18 and 19. For the wrath of God is revealed from heaven against all ungodliness and unrighteousness of men, who by their unrighteousness suppress the truth. For what can be known about God is plain to them, because God has shown it to them. Or Romans 3, 9 through 10. What then? Are we Jews any better off? No, not at all. For we have already charged that all, both Jews and Greeks, are under sin. 
as it is written, none is righteous, no, not one. And even a few chapters later in Genesis, Genesis 6, 5, the Lord saw that the wickedness of man was great in the earth and that every intention of the thoughts of his heart was only evil continually. So we see some common threads, some common characteristics of sin throughout these verses, right? Sin is lawlessness. Sin is unrighteousness. It's the opposite of God. Sin surpa surpasses the truth, suppresses the truth. All types of people sin. It's a universal trait. Sin is wickedness. Sin is evil. Sin affects our thoughts, our nature, and our most inward being. And with these basic understandings of sin, let's dive into Genesis 3. Let's dive into what it says here. And first, on your handout as well, sin is deceptive. Sin is deceptive. Consider the first three verses of Genesis 3. The serpent was more crafty than any other beast of the field that the Lord God had made. He said to the woman, did God actually say you shall not eat of any tree in the garden? And the woman said to the serpent, we may eat of the fruit of the trees in the garden. But God said, you shall not eat of the fruit of the tree that is in the midst of the garden. Neither shall you touch it, lest you die. Sin is deceptive. Think about the serpent. Now, just from reading this passage, we don't really, un we don't really know a lot. Where did this serpent come from? Now, the word's translated to some kind of snake being. We don't know what kind necessarily, but we do know it was some kind of snake that was obviously not normal because when you think about it, God created all things good and he said they were very good. So a snake in essence would not have been a bad thing. Something's going on here, right? Now, it doesn't say in our chapter that it was Satan, but from other passage, which passages, we do know it was. Revelation 12, 9 says, And that great dragon was thrown down, the ancient serpent, who is called the devil and Satan, the deceiver of the whole world. He was thrown down to the earth, and his angels were thrown down with him. And then in Revelation 12, 22, it says, And he seized the dragon, the ancient serpent, who is the devil and Satan, and bound him for a thousand years. So it's clear that this was not some simple snake. No, this was an evil power using this snake. It was Satan. The serpent was being influenced by him to tempt Eve to sin. Tempt Eve to sin. And it was because the lure of self-sufficiency. The lure of self-sufficiency. Think about it like this. The seed of self-sufficiency is being grown here. Now, what do I mean? I mean that the desire to be like God or independent from God was Eve's desire the whole time. And that's what Satan is tempting Eve to want. And we see this today as well. We see this in our own lives. We should never think that we're better than Eve and Adam, but we are not. Human hearts that stubbornly think of themselves as basically good and self-sufficient, this idea that human beings are fundamentally sinful and rebellious is not merely scandalous. It is revolting. We don't like to think that we're dependent on someone else, do we? We don't like to think that we're dependent on God. And Eve did not want to be dependent on God as well. She wanted to be self-sufficient. When we think about it, we find that without God, that is when real trouble happens. And I don't think Eve was the only one that thought this way. You and I still deny our need for God every day, our dependence on Him, and this is sin. When we think we need something so bad, we talk so often about these idols of our hearts. We want these things in our lives, and we desire them. We want them. These wants become needs, and these needs become desires, and we'll do whatever it takes to get them. And ultimately, we sin because we think we need that over pleasing God. Sure, some days we acknowledge this, but typically we don't. Some days we repent of this, but other days we don't. We allow these sins to creep in our lives because they're so deceptive. Sin is deceptive. We see in verses 2 and 3, we see Eve even misquote what God has said. And you see this deception even starting to build in her mind that she's trying to 
refocus what God has already said. We need to see this desire for this forbidden thing to be like God, to be self-sufficient in her life. You see this desire growing in her the whole time forgetting that God gave them everything in the world. God gave them the best garden. God gave them every other tree to eat of. And she just wants this one. That's exactly how sin works in our lives too. It creeps in and we don't want to face the realities of it, but we, we desire this one thing that God gives us all these other things, but we want that one thing. You know, in his book, Respectable Sins, Gary Bridges points out many of these sins that we tolerate in our lives, but we shouldn't. He mentions, here are a few, anxiety, discontentment, unthankfulness, complaining, pride, selfishness, lack of self-control, impatience and irritability, anger, judgmentalism, envy, jealousy, sins of the tongue, and worldliness. We let these sins so often, far too common, we let these sins come into our lives. They creep in. We're deceived by the sin because it is so deceptive. I challenge you, don't give in to the temptation as even Adam did. Don't give in to this temptation. Depend on God. Identify these areas in your life that you struggle with. Think about it honestly. And if you can't think of any, which may be hard and may be a sign of pride anyways, ask your spouse. Ask someone you trust to speak the truth in your life to rid these areas of sin that have crept in and are deceiving you. Second, Sin is deliberate. Looking back at verses 4 through 6. But the serpent said to the woman, You will not surely die, for God knows that when you eat of it, your eyes will be opened, and you will be like God, knowing good and evil. So when the woman saw that the tree was good for food, and that it was a light to the eyes, and that the tree was to be desired to make one wise, she took of its fruit and ate. And she also gave some to her husband who was with her, and he ate. Now think about this. Think about the irony here. Think about the irony of the serpent's remarks. The couple, Adam and Eve, unlike the serpent, had been made in the image of God. In that way, they were already like God. Moreover, being in the image of God... They are expected to exercise authority over all the beasts of the field, which includes the serpent. But by obeying the serpent, however, they betray the trust placed in them by God. This is not merely an act of disobedience, it is an act of treachery. Those who were meant to govern the earth on God's behalf instead rebel against their divine king and obey one of his creatures. This was a deliberate attempt by Satan to distort God's word and to see mankind's sin. And think about it like this. Everything was upside down in the garden. Everything was upside down. Eve followed the snake, which they were to rule over. Adam followed Eve, which he was the head of. And no one followed God. No one followed God. It's so saddening. It's so saddening. But it was a deliberate choice. Eve made this choice to sin. Adam made this choice to sin. And the sin did not begin by just eating the fruit, but the desire to eat the fruit and be like God. Thus, we have the fall of God's greatest creation, mankind. And the innocence of the Garden of Eden was ruined by the entry of sin. The mistakes of Adam and Eve are typical of all sins, but as they were the parents of the whole human race, their deeds had the greatest consequences. Sin had entered the creation. And Olivia, I'm going to have you, to kind of illustrate this, I I thought of this yesterday night, Um, Olivia's going to come help me. No? Okay. Olivia, I'm going to have her hold this, or I'm going to hold this cup of water, because if we spill, Teresa will not be happy. Um, this is just a cup of water. It's to illustrate this point, but go ahead. Putting one drop in here. There you go. 
And as you'll notice, and we did this at lunch too, and as you'll notice, it's just a simple cup, thanks Lou, it's just a simple cup of water with a cup of a little drop of food coloring. And what will happen as I lead this over there, and as it's already happening, as it will, as you know, it will take over the water. And eventually, all you'll really see is the purple. And this is a perfect illustration of sin. Starting in the garden, it took one sin to infect all of mankind. Every day when we let one sin creep in, and I actually like how it just doesn't turn purple all of a sudden, because it kind of slowly takes over. And this is how sin is. When we let it creep in, we delete that deliberate choice to sin. We let it happen, and it creeps in. It goes slowly, but all of a sudden, we're captivated by it. Captivated by that sin. Captivated by it. Now, this is just a fun little thing that I thought Olivia would enjoy with me, but it does illustrate the point. Though small at first, over time, the entire water cup will fill as we're standing here and as we're listening to this. Even though that one drop is so small, it took over, and it will take over that entire drink over time. And this is how sin is. At this one point in history, though it was just a piece of fruit, sin entered the world and it has spread and infects every part of us. In fact, it will get so bad in a few chapters, as we know with the flood, that God will even destroy almost all of his creation. What he called so very good here in Genesis, back in Genesis 1, he will eventually destroy. Except for a few, Noah and his family and God hates sin. Why? Because sin, third, is disastrous. Disastrous. Back at verse 7. Then the eyes of both were opened, and they knew that they were naked. And they sewed fig leaves together and made themselves loincloths. Eating the fruit does transform the couple but not like they thought it would, not for the better. The disastrous consequences of Adam's sin cannot be overemphasized, resulting in the fall of mankind, the beginning of every sin, suffering, and pain. This was one event that changed everything. We see in our text tonight that their eyes were open and their innocence was lost. Now, we don't have time to go through all the consequences We could, but I I didn't plan on doing that tonight. Um, But we see those in the rest of Genesis 3. But the Bible makes it clear that the fall brought sin into every subsequent person's life. One's capacity for sin is inborn. A person is a sinner before he has the opportunity to sin. All have inherited the effects of Adam's fall. The effect of the fall in the human race can be summarized as this, guilt, punishment, and corruption. The human race has been completely affected by sin. We should remember one thing, and as we think about this, sin does affect every part of us, every day. Those pains you feel in the morning, those headaches, like this up and down weather, I've had constant off and on migraines. All these things, the weeds in the yard, all these things are infected by sin. Sometimes we don't think about it, but it it does affect every part of us. We can't escape it, but we need hope. Where does hope, where is hope found? Hope is found in Jesus. Now, although we don't see this here in this passage, we know what the rest of the Bible says, right? We know where the hope is coming. The glory of Christ is the main purpose that God had in mind when he permitted Adam's sin and with the fall of all humanity into sin. Jesus gives us hope. The Bible is not about us. It is about King Jesus. It is about Him. Adam and Eve's failure points to their need for Christ. Points to their need for Christ. And though we don't see it right here, we do see it in Romans. We are not left alone in our sin. Looking at Romans 5, couple of verses there, 12, and 12 through 14. Therefore, just as sin came into the world through one man, and death through sin, 
And so death spread to all men because all sinned. For sin indeed was in the world before the law was given. But sin is not counted where there is no law. Yet death reigned from Adam to Moses, even over those whose sinning was not like the transgression of Adam, who was a type of the one to come. And now skipping to verses 17 and 21. For if because of one man's trespass, death reigned through that one man, much more will those who receive the abundance of grace and the free gift of righteousness reign in life through the one man, Jesus Christ. So that as sin reigned in death, grace also might reign through righteousness, leading to eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. 1 Corinthians 15, 22, For as in Adam all die, so also in Christ shall all be made alive. Hope is found in Jesus. He is the one who took our sin. If we're believers tonight, he is the one who took our sin, died on the cross, was buried and rose again, He's preparing a place for us in heaven. But also, there's also another hope. Another hope that is found in Revelation 20, verse 10. And the devil who had deceived them was thrown into the lake of fire and sulfur. And the beast and the false prophet were, and they will be tormented day and night forever and ever. Romans sixteen twenty. The God of peace will soon crush Satan under your feet. The grace of our Lord Jesus Christ be with you. Our great night. And I, my mind goes to, if you've ever seen uh, the Lord of the Rings, uh, one of the... One of my favorite parts of the whole show is uh, they're, they're fighting in this last battle. They're barely making it. And all of a sudden, you see um, Gandalf, thank you, riding over the hill. And there's this bright light. And you, you think about that. You think about this great night. Our great night, Jesus, will one day come and crush Satan. He will crush Satan. He will crush sin. We will no longer, when we are glorified with him, have to deal with this sinfulness anymore. That is a glorious day. A glorious day that we can look forward to. And in this internal reign, we will enjoy as our supreme treasure the beauty and worth of Jesus Christ, whose glory shines all the more brightly against the backdrop of Adam's spectacular sin. Now, we could end here, but we're not, uh, because what about the sin that we deal with every day? Yeah, we have hope in Jesus, but what about the daily struggle of putting off the old self and putting on the new self? How do we deal with this daily battle with sin? How do we deal with it? And the first thing, we, we have to repent. We have to realize there are areas in our life that we sin and we struggle with every day. And yours may be a sp specific area that is different than mine, but we all deal with it in some way. We must repent of those sins that are in our life. 1 John 1, nine says, If we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. In Romans 5.8, most of you probably know this, God shows his love for us and that while we were still sinners, Christ died for this. And knowing this truth, knowing that God will forgive us. We must repent and believe the gospel because we need to deal with our sin. We need to deal with them. And what I mean by that is we need to put them to death. We need to be putting our sins to death, and that means we need to be actively killing them. It was John Owen who said, Be killing sin or it will be killing you. Romans 8.13 says, For if you live according to the flesh, you will die. But if by the Spirit you put to death the deeds of the body, you will live. My sin and your sin will not just go away. It's not just going to run away one day. No, it's going to be there. And if you are not putting sin to death, then you will find that it is seeking your destruction. It's seeking your destruction. And in the end, you are called to kill sin 
because it seeks to lead you away from the hope of the gospel. And you are able to kill sin because of the hope of the gospel. We must be putting sin to death in our lives if we want to grow in the grace and peace of Jesus Christ. Yes, we look forward to that one day, that hope of being with Jesus. But right here, right now, we have a battle that's taking place. We need to fit ourselves with the sword of the Spirit, our Bibles, the Word of God. Be putting sin to death in our, in our bodies. Be putting sin to death so that we might glorify and please Him on this road of sanctification and being made more like Jesus. Adam and Eve made horrible choices that day. Any of us would have made the same choice. And it cannot be overemphasized the magnitude that those decisions made. But ultimately, those decisions can be summed up by one word, sin. Sin affects you and I in more ways than we can ever imagine. We are hopeless in our sins. But praise be to Jesus that we find hope in Him. Yes, sin is deceptive, sin is deliberate, and sin is disastrous. Don't take it lightly. Don't take it lightly. For some reason, I can't speak very well tonight, but don't take sin lightly. Creep sin you can get a stronghold to the point that you don't even realize it, and all of a sudden, you're in a mess, right? You're in a mess. Take it seriously. Your family needs this example of you. Your neighbors need this hope that is in you, this hope that Jesus is more higher. Jesus is king in your life, and you desire for him. Your family needs to see that hope in you. Your neighbors need to see that hope in you. Church needs to see that hope in you, so we can encourage one another to keep fighting sin, keep putting it to death, so that we might glorify him that we might be more holy. Commit to living this life with King Jesus. Let's put our sins to death today. Father, I thank you tonight for the word. I thank you, God, for passages like Genesis 3 that call us out, to teach us about the sin that is in our lives, the sins that we that are not so uncommon from Adam and Eve. God, we desire to be self-sufficient, desire to rebel against you. I thank you for Jesus. I thank you for the hope that we find in him. I thank you that we can repent, that you forgive us, and that God, we can be more like Jesus. And I pray tonight that as we walk out tonight, that we will not just forget about this, but that we will take our sins seriously because you take them seriously to the point that you died on the cross for them. Took them on and you died for them. God, I pray that uh, through this week that we will be thinking of the different ways that sin has crept in and that we will look to put it to death. We will kill it. Thank you for Jesus. I pray that we will consistently make him King and Lord every day of our lives. He will be our focal point. In Christ's name I pray.